I want to give you a little intro to uh, Hill Malatino. Uh, they are an assistant professor in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Penn State and a research associate at the Rock Institute. Um, their first book is out. Um, it's Queer Embodiment, Medical Violence and Intersex. Um, sorry. Uh, Monstrosity, Medical Violence and Intersex Experience uh, on uh, University of Nebraska Press. And uh, their new research and writing addresses uh, transition, negative effect, uh, care work, and trans fertility. And uh, landmark trans and, uh, and queer theorist uh, Susan Stryker says, queer embodiment joins a small shelf of important work in her critical intersex studies in beautifully written, lucidly argued, theoretically sharp, and emotionally evocative prose. Malatino articulates queer and trans theory with continental philosophy and a radically conscious decolonial perspective to produce a teratologically sublime work of scholarship on bodies that challenge our culture's belief in biolo uh, biologically based binary genders. Now, I don't know what some of those words mean. I can tell you. <laughs> and Hill will definitely tell you. Um, but uh, that's really enough from me. Uh, they speak for themselves. Um, and they speak for all of us sometimes. <laughs> this is uh, Hill Malatino. All right. Hey, y'all. You can hear me okay? So this being at Google is really strange. I've been telling Matt all day, like in academia, we have usually two screens max and like non-functioning tech equipment all the time. So this, I'm a little bit weirded out, but I'm trying to like be cool about it. I'm just not used to this environment. So what I'm going to do today is give a really brief overview of what intersex is for those of you who might not be familiar with with the term and what it denotes, and then read a bit from my book and then talk about what a vision for social justice might be for intersex folk. So that should take me maybe 25 or 30 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have a fair amount of time for Q&A at the end of this. So I'm managing a lot of things because I insisted on wearing a scarf and don't have a mic. So I've got like to hold a book, I've got to hold a clicker, um, try to make sure this thing stays by my mouth, but I'm gonna do my best. So. This is a pretty broad definition of intersex from Interact, Advocates for Intersex Youth, which is probably the most active and vibrant intersex advocacy organization in the United States at this moment, although they work on a transnational scale. So I'll just read it and then talk through it a little bit. Intersex refers to people who are born with any range of sex characteristics that may not fit a doctor's notions of binary male or female bodies. Variations may appear in a person's chromosomes, genitals, or internal organs like testes or ovaries. Some intersex traits are identified at birth, while others may, be, may not be discovered until puberty or later in life. People with intersex traits have always existed, but there is more awareness now about the diversity of human bodies. People with intersex bodies, like anyone who may be seen as different, sometimes face discrimination, including in healthcare settings as early as infancy. There were 30 specific intersex variations, and each intersex person is different. So that's all from Interact. And I think it's just important to begin the talk with this acknowledgement. There's been a lot of debate over what conditions might be included under this broad umbrella term that is intersex. If you want to go into that in q and I'm happy to do that. But the statistical sort of reference that gets used most often these days is intersex conditions, if we're using this sort of big tent definition, are about as common as folks with red hair. So it's kind of... Uh, shocking that we don't talk more about this culturally and think more about this culturally, and that we still are sort of taught systematically in our biology courses when we're young that human sex differentiation is binary when it's actually anything but, right? So I just want to have that up and then read a little bit from the, the prologue of this book, Queer Embodiment, um, which is titled Neither Nor, Notes on Theory and Livability. And it starts with an epigraph from Butler, who I've been reading since I was a tiny child, and I can't stop, for better or worse. Um, and this is from a preface to like the 1999 edition, the reissue of Gender Trouble, 
um, where she writes, there's nothing radical about common sense. She was talking about Adorno, I think, but I just take this anyway and use it for my own purposes. Um, okay, so there's nothing radical about common sense. I was 16 when I first received an intersex diagnosis, though that wasn't the terminology used. I'd gone to a general practitioner. I hesitate to say my general practitioner. His regular physician visits were an irregularity in the hovering around the poverty line world of my adolescence to find out why I hadn't begun to menstruate. After multiple visits, blood work, and trips to specialists, I was told that I wouldn't be able to have children, that my body needed a bit of a push if it were going to more adequately feminize. When I requested my medical files years later while in graduate school, I noticed that the formal diagnosis used in those files was testicular feminization, an anachronistic term even then, in the late 1990s, when the contemporary diagnostic terminology was androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS. What being androgen insensitive means is this. I have XY chromosomes, but my body is unable to respond to so-called masculinizing hormones, resulting in a more female typical appearance, but without reproductive ability and the capacity to menstruate. Androgen insensitivity comes in both complete and partial varieties. Folks with partial androgen insensitivity syndrome, or PAIS, tend to have more mixed sex traits than those who are completely androgen insensitive. I have PAIS. I was told that I had gonads sunk deep in my lower abdomen that would need to be removed because they were, quite evidently, useless on account of their indecision. They seemed to have no idea what they wanted to be when they grew up. Testes? Ovaries? Eh. They were content to make a little nest in my viscera and crouch there until, until a urological surgeon removed them, following a consult with a pediatric endocrinologist. The stated reason was that there was a high risk of them becoming cancerous, which is a risk difficult to argue with when you're a kid, but also it's important to note that whatever gonads you have, right, they might become cancerous. So this is like my initiation into the medical doublespeak used in the context of intersex treatment. Um, as a side, so a side benefit, I was told, was that the removal would decrease the levels of masculinizing hormones in my body. Supplemented with estrogen pills, I develop larger breasts, my fat distribution would alter, and I develop a more conventionally feminine figure. On estrogen, I would inhabit a corporeality very different from the athletic, rather railish one I dwelt in at 16. These are things that a teenage tomboy doesn't necessarily want to hear or to experience. After being on Premarin, which is one of the major mass market hormone replacement therapy pills, which some of you might be familiar with, for a handful of months, I simply stopped taking it. I'd gained something close to 20 pounds, felt like an emotional wreck, probably on account of altering my body chemistry while I was grappling existentially with the shock of an intersex diagnosis, and was self-medicating with many other substances to cope, or rather not cope, with these substantial shifts in my body schema and, by extension, my most basic modes of being in the world. So, when my mother asked me why I stopped taking hormones, I told her I was vegan and that the thought of taking a pill derived from mare's urine clashed significantly with the ethics and politics of my dietary practices. What I actually said was more along the lines of, I don't wear leather or eat dairy, so why would I swallow horse piss every day? <laughs> and that's indeed how, right, Premarin it's, is made. Um, it's a portmanteau of pregnant mare, right, Prem, Marin. If you didn't know, now you know. So that was the last time we mentioned it. The pills were sunk in the garbage, covered over with coffee grinds, and taken to the landfill. What was actually happening was much more complicated than a rigid dietary choice. I was tacitly refusing the idea that my body needed hormonal modification, that the advice of the medical establishment to ameliorate my failure to present as hyperbolically feminine was something other than sage, something less than useful for a mask of center queer kid who didn't want to inhabit that kind of body to begin with. There's a way in which receiving a diagnosis of this sort whittles down the complexity of subjective realities. I experienced that diagnosis, despite the softened rhetoric utilized by the medical professionals I interfaced with, is a declaration that I was neither male nor female on the realest level possible, that of the biological. This is, in part, why many intersex folks, myself included, are hesitant to mention their status as intersex unless rather necessary, although I guess I should revise this now. Right, I guess I'm not hesitant to mention it anymore because here I am. Um, but whatever, at one point. Um, so yeah, wouldn't mention it in the con unless right, in the context of sexual disclosure. Your congenital quirks often become the scrim or filter through which all other subjective aspects are read. You date women, men, and non-binary folks, both cis and trans, 
probably because you're intersex. You're a gender transgressive young thing, one who skateboarded and played in punk bands, probably because you're intersex. This reductive game could proceed interminably, right? So it was this moment when I was young where I realized if people knew I was intersex, anything that was con like conceived of as somehow gender transgressive or inappropriate would be attributed to the biological reality of my body, which I felt was pretty fucked up, right? For reasons that we can talk about in the Q and A. Um, so. Philosopher Liddell McWhorter writes of this phenomenon in a different, though resonant, register, dilating on the ways in which she experienced coming out as a lesbian in the U.S. South in the 1970s. She describes the process as an emptying out of subjective interiority and identitarian complexity. After struggling for years against inhabiting an identity that didn't seem chosen, but rather, as she writes, steadily and progressively constituted and enforced at both micro and macro political levels for over a dozen years, she willingly, whatever that could possibly mean here, affirmed it. She writes, quote, once I conceded the struggle and acknowledged, to myself at least, what I am, she puts that in scare quotes, the issue that confronted me was how to be it. According to everybody around me, homosexuals didn't have an inner life, didn't think or feel anything. Queers were surfaces merely, across which gender transgressions were written. It was as though to be queer was to be some sort of puppet whose strings were pulled by sexuality alone. Queers did nothing but perform, gaily, of course. Real feelings, thoughts, analyses, assessments, decisions, dreams, hopes, and ideas were only for straight people. Only straight people actually had a point of view. Homosexuals could be seen, but their eyes stared blankly back. There was no real person in there. So once I'd acknowledged that I was a homosexual, what then? How could I be that? How could that have an I? Actually, let me skip. So I sat with this quote of McWhorter's for, for quite a long time, and it became one of the central preoccupations of my own research over the course of the last, like, God, 15 years now. Um, Right? How could I be that? How could that have an eye? We're constantly taught that intersex embodiment and intersex modes of being are basically an impossibility or at best a pathology that needs to be corrected, right? Um, but if you reject that logic, then where does that leave you? It leaves you in kind of an impossible subject position, right? So a lot of what I write about in this book has to do with that impossibility and how you live with that impossibility. So similar to what McMorder describes, the notion that I was intersex was something that arrived from without, something that was steadily constituted at micro and macro political levels through, and these are all things I talk about in the book, developments in medical imaging technology, mutations in Western epistemologies of gender, medico-scientific congresses, case study interviews, blood work, and transformations in genetic research, among other phenomena. Long before I ever began the slow process of trying to make sense of myself in relationship to it. The question of consent or choice was as fuzzy for me as it was for McWhorter. When a verdict on what sort of being you are is delivered from without, particularly if that verdict bears the, bears the locutionary force of a medical professional, right? we're taught not to agree with doctors and basically treat what they say as truth, um, it's not a label you can choose or willingly assume. Rather, an authoritative judgment has been made regarding what sort of subspecies you are. The truth has been delivered, and your choices seem limited to acceptance or denial, which, of course, can take many forms. I accepted the diagnosis. I did not attempt to evade or deny the knowledge that was connoted by it, essentially that I was neither male nor female. This knowledge, however, seemed to relegate me to an impossible subject position. It placed me squarely in the midst of a set of quandaries that echo, in part, those McWhorter faced. I was forced, once I'd acknowledged that I was intersex, to ask, how could I be that? How could that have an I? But that was precisely the sort of thing I wasn't supposed to be asking. I was supposed to heed the rhetoric of the medical professionals who focused on the notion that I was an unfinished woman, one who needed a bit of help along the path to full-blown ladyhood. I was meant to construe the diagnosis as a congenital disorder that didn't trouble me at the most basic ontological level, right, at the fundamental sort of level of being. The performative linguistic protocols, meaning the way that doctors talk about this stuff, um, utilized by medical professionals in intersex diagnosis guard against this set of existential dilemmas regarding what one is, right? They're trying to sort of prevent it from occurring within the patients that they treat. 
They're trained, though unevenly, given the relative infrequency of patients with intersex conditions crossing their paths, to emphasize the rightness of a sexually dimorphic understanding of embodiment, and to posit the intersex patient is already well on their way toward one or the other of two incontrovertible sexes, and that sex is usually female for reasons I'll discuss in a second. The set of protocols springs from an entrenched position, or entrenched, an entrenched perception, sorry, of intersex bodies as natural errors. Nature, whatever that is, had a set of intentions for a body, but somehow some other agencies intervened, and these intentions were forced off track, thrown awry. It's the job of medical professionals to fulfill the goals that nature, that strange entity, had all along. Within this schema, one can of course not be mixed sex or perhaps something other than male or female, but not only that. Within this schema, sex is nothing more complex than a strictly dimorphic conception of bodies allows. Within this schema, intersex bodies are inevitably failures, falling short of the dyadic natural forms of maleness and femaleness. But failures can be corrected. Bodies can be placed in remediation. Enter hormonal treatment, genital surgery, electrolysis, post-surgical vaginal dilation, and the injunction delivered by many medical professionals that one must never speak of one's <laughs> intersex condition unless absolutely necessary. But I wasn't buying that narrative, right? The notion that nature had an intention that my body was somehow disobeying or belying, that I was a failed but remediable woman. It didn't resonate with me. It seemed that I failed to meet the constitutive criteria for womanhood at what I had been taught was the most basic level, the biological, and that no amount of gender appropriate dressage would change that. That was when I began to ask myself if I could inhabit a specifically intersex identity. I was preoccupied above all with the question of what I was now that I've considered myself neither male nor female. Some big questions concerning me in no particular order what was wrong with conventional understandings of biological sex if a being like me could be produced? What did being intersex mean in terms of my sexuality? Could I still be heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual? Did any of these sexual identities pertain? Did this mean that my long history of gender transgression was somehow genetically encoded? Was there a way of being a person that didn't rely on also being male or female? Was I human? What was human? What were these biological entities called men and women? What was this phenomena termed biological sex? On what grounds was it distinguished from this other phenomena termed gender? If I was intersex, could I also be a woman or a man? If so, how? Through what understandings of gender, sex, the natural, the socially constructed, was this rendered either possible or impossible? These are enormous, unwieldy questions for a 16-year-old to grapple with. And indeed, I spent most of my adult life trying to answer them in some way, shape, or form. And most of that work, like the math, right, is, is here, if you're interested. So I'm going to stop reading there. Um, but I just feel like it's important to insert myself in my own narrative within this broader conversation, right? So you all know at least what my stakes are when I suggest or talk through the points I'm about to. So I'm sure some of this is familiar to to some of you, but I wanted to get it all on the board, right? So this is a running and incomplete list of intersex injustices. I'm sure we could add to this, but these are the big ones, at least in my thinking. Um, the first is the frequency of non-consensual and coercive medical treatment up to and including clitoridectomy. So this began to happen around the middle of the 19, or of the 20th century, right? So in the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, and was primarily spearheaded by this, this guy, John Money, who wasn't a medical doctor, but worked in concert with medical doctors, particularly at the Johns Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic um, in Baltimore, Maryland, at the, in the middle of the 20th century. And that was a clinic that saw intersex children and infants, and that also treated trans adults. Um, <laughs> which means that some of the surgical procedures that were being utilized on intersex infants were then refined and used on trans adults. So I mention that because intersex history and trans history, if we're thinking about medical institutions specifically, are really, really deeply interwoven. And for me, this means that intersex activism and trans activism, especially around questions of depathologization, are deeply allied to one another. Um, but anyway, the practice of non-consensual or coercive gender assignment and then hormonal and surgical treatment began in the 1950s with John Money who recommended that 
infants be assigned a gender if they're born mixed sex or intersex visibly, right? And not everybody is born visibly mixed sex who has an intersex condition, but those who were should be assigned a gender as early as possible and then have their genitalia reconstructed in line with that gender. And the argument that he made was if caretakers were relating to an intersex child who is visibly intersex, they would treat that child differently in a way that would be psychologically scarring, right? So early genital surgery was really, really important. And this became standard practice and because surgically it's much easier to perform vaginoplasty than it is phalloplasty, that remains the case. Um, most of these infants were assigned female and had genital surgery performed at relatively young ages, right? And this is a practice that continues. It's not quite as widespread as it used to be because since the mid to late 1990s, there's been significant activist pushback against this practice, but it still persists in many major medical research institutions across the country. So that's one sort of important injustice. And it's also worth mentioning that these treatments were fallow clitoral reductions, often to the point of complete clitoridectomy. Right? And there's one in the medical archives that I've worked in, which are housed primarily at Indiana University and the Kinsey Institute. Um, I came across a statement by John Money, the architect of this, this medical protocol, where he argued, and he actually used the language of clitoridectomy, but he said that there's no proof that clitoridectomy causes a decrease in sexual functioning or sexual pleasurable response in the clitoris, which makes no sense because you can't remove something and then still have it be like, still have it experience pleasure, right? But he said, there's no, I think the wording was, there's no deleterious effect of clitoridectomy on sexual pleasure for intersex subjects. So yeah, there's that. That's important to mention, it's fucked. Um, so also enduring trauma, right? So when you're an intersex infant or child and you're subject to these forms of coercive medical treatment up to and including clitoridectomy, um, that also means that you have a long history of going to see medical professionals without a clear understanding of what the treatment is about, what they're attempting to do. And you're being given this double speak, right? So you're told that you just need a little bit of a push in the direction of becoming a sort of proper, normal woman with a normal genitalia. And for these medical professionals, having normal genitals meant having a vagina that was able to intermit an average size, whatever that is, <laughs> penis, right? Um, so you're experiencing this treatment, but nobody's telling you what's happening. You just know that medical professionals are sort of investigating your body and your genitalia specifically for years and years, multiple appointments, sometimes multiple surgeries over the course of many years. And there's a ton of stigma and secrecy and shame that surrounds these visits. So that means that many intersex adults, um, many intersex youth and adults have this sort of longstanding complex PTSD because of the medical treatment that they've received, right? So not necessarily how they've been received by people in their social world, but specifically stemming from the medical treatment that was supposed to rehabilitate them or normalize them. So there's also inadequate medical and psychological care in the aftermath of these treatments. So if medical professionals find out you're intersex, there's a large apparatus of doctors that are willing to offer you hormonal and surgical treatment to normalize your body. But there are very, very few who are intersex competent and able to offer like primary medical care that's not stigmatizing or psychological care that can deal with the trauma and the fallout that stems from this really, really problematic medical protocol. So you have an army of, of physicians that are like willing to normalize you, but very, very few who are willing to help you live in the body that you have, right? And that see it as sort of non-pathological or um, perfectly okay the way it is, regardless of whether you've accessed hormones and surgery or not. So silent shame and stigma around intersex conditions, right? Very, very few people are actually willing to talk about these things publicly, in large part because most folks are either aware of it in a very sort of fetishistic way or a voyeuristic way, right? Like a real life intersex person is talking, my God, right? I've never seen this before, um, which does not create a good dialogic space. Um, or because they've been taught that, that intersex bodies are in some ways impossibilities or monstrous, right? 
um, freakish. So we see less in, in popular media today, there are less and less jokes about hermaphrodites, right? But when I was coming of age in the 90s, they were pretty frequent. And I actually never heard about intersex conditions except through popular comedy, right? Where there were jokes being made about hermaphroditic bodies. So that was my entry into the kind of being that I was, right? At least as far as mainstream media was concerned. So there is this intense stigma um, and ongoing social illegibility and invisibility due to lack of public awareness and continuing institutional entrenchment of binary sex. So if you're thinking about this like casually, when you were taught about biological sex differentiation in school, if you remember it at all, were intersex issues on the radar for any of you? Yeah, I mean, it's usually like a very small unit, even in college classrooms, and intersex bodies at most, or intersex conditions, might be a footnote, right? But it's not really on the map at all. We're not taught that biological sex differentiation is infinitely more complicated than just this binary sex schematic that we've been given. And I'm very interested in changing that, right? Most of us are familiar with thinking about gender as a spectrum, but very few of us have extended that to the way we think about biological sex. And I think if we're going to achieve any kind of justice for intersex folk, that shift has to happen, right? Not just gender, but biological sex has to be seen as a, a spectrum, a continuum, or maybe something more complex metaphorically than that, right? So that's the, the short list of injustices. And it feeds pretty naturally into the second short list. And this is the last slide, I promise, and then we can all talk with each other. So when I think about what social justice for intersex folks might look like, the first thing is informed consent and bodily autonomy in all medical and therapeutic spaces, right? But informed consent and bodily autonomy are really thorny concepts. And I say this because when you think about, or when I think about my experience as an intersex youth, let me use like personal language, when I was 16 and I was diagnosed with an intersex condition and then I was offered this sort of normalizing therapy for my body, um, it was in the context, so I was old enough to consent technically, right, to any procedure and I consented, whatever that might mean, to a gonadectomy, right, because I was told this, would, this will make your body less masculine and because you've been assigned female at birth and raised as a girl, that's probably what you want, right? But at 16, I couldn't articulate like a counter argument to that, right? I just knew that I was not normal and then I had medical professionals telling me we can make you normal, this is how we do it. And I agreed to a gonadectomy and now I wish I hadn't, right? Because it's sort of wreaked havoc on my hormones. Also, whatever, it's a long, long story that I don't need to get into right now. But I wish that gonadectomy hadn't happened. And even though I consented to it, it happened under conditions of such incredible coercion, in large part because I had no role models for what it would be to live in a, in a body that was other than binary, right? This is the late 1990s, and I might have been able to turn to trans folks um, as role models, right, in some way, just in terms of their ability to resist um, sort of coercive modes of binary gender and live otherwise, but they weren't really accessible to me, right, in media at that time. So, yeah. So consent and autonomy are really, really thorny concepts because when we live in a world that insists on binary sex, any decision you make is going to be a decision you make under, a con under conditions of coercion because the binary sex schematic itself is coercive. But anyway, so that would all have to change. Accessible, affordable, and intersex competent healthcare is another must. And anecdotally, right, another short story. I recently was scouting a primary care physician because I moved to Pennsylvania and you know, wanted like adequate healthcare. I have good insurance. I work for a major research institution. I was like, I should have a doctor. Um, and I hadn't had a doctor for 10 years because I was really terrified of medical professionals because they were at best clueless and at worst like sort of perniciously trying to shoehorn me into treatments that I wasn't interested in. So I go to see a, a doctor. I have a PCP now. She's pretty wonderful. But our first visit together, I said, hey, I have this condition. And she's like, oh, I've heard of that maybe once or twice, but I really don't know anything about it. Do you mind if I look it up? 
So she looked it up in the room with me and I was like, oh, well, I can work with this. This person has a great degree of humility, right, about their knowledge. But that was kind of the best I could hope for, right? Because I can't expect medical practitioners at the level of, at the PCP level to be intersex competent. I'm probably, especially because I live in like a small college town in rural PA, um, the only patient they've come across in their practice, right? So that's a, a huge issue, I think. And then something else that would have to change is we would have to move beyond sexual dimorphism and the way we understand bodies and biological sex, which means delinking assumed continuities between chromosomes, hormones, genitals, reproductive. And you can see I put non-reproductive there because sometimes the organs that we have are not capable of reproduction, even though they exist, um, and so-called secondary sex characteristics. So these naturalized linkages happen all the time, just in the way that we speak about bodies, right? And the way that we talk about maleness and femaleness, masculinity and femininity, femininity, um, even among those who are incredibly trans and maybe even intersex aware, right? There's still this tendency to link up XX chromosomes with female embodiment and assume all sorts of stuff about the condition of one's corporeality, right? Um, and index that with chromosomal language or gendered language. So we would have to delink all of those things and no longer infer anything really about embodiment from the, prone, the gender pronoun somebody uses, right? And this is another place where I think intersex activism really dovetails with trans activism, right? This is a call that's been very firmly, firmly articulated by trans activists for a while. And the delinking of genitalia from gender, right, specifically, um, and that would need to happen to do any kind of justice to intersex folks and intersex conditions. And then finally, and this is where I out myself as like a gender abolitionist, right? And also a sex abolitionist, um, an end to binary sex and gender at every level, whether it's like the micro interpersonal level to the institutional level. So yeah, I guess I'll stop there because I think I've probably been going on for a little while, but I would love to talk with you all more for the next few minutes. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, so that is the, the portion where Hill speaks, and now uh, Hill will speak with us. Um, there are a couple of microphones in the room, and um, for those on the live stream, if you want to use the Dory link, go for that. Um, we'll be reviewing that here and there. Um, I have a couple questions to start us off. Um, and the, uh, do you want the tech question or the social question first? Do you all want the tech question or the social, the tech question? Probably. Yeah, I mean, you, you happen to be at Google. I do happen to be at Google. That doesn't mean I'm going to give a competent response. There might be people in the no, room no, that this can is give fine. better responses than me, depending no. on what you ask. No, no. Yeah. So <laughs> when you talk about doctors giving diagnoses or really kind of trying to give sort of truth to things or truth as they see it. You know, we, we think in the tech universe that we often discern things. So when we talk about AI, ML, et cetera, when we are looking at photos and assessing things about what we're seeing in photos, often that is coupled in, in these similar ways where, you know, we're saying, oh, this subject in this photo is female. This subject in this photo is male. And we just kind of add those as, as normal classifications. And I say normal not because I think that that's appropriate, but like just commonly. Obviously, you probably think that's wrong and we shouldn't do it. But what can we do instead? This might be the hard question. But what are the constructs that we can be using to help recognize people? Yeah, so there's, okay, so I'm gonna start with two references before I go into attempting to answer this because there Please. are people that have written about this in ways that I find really compelling. Awesome. Um, there's a book by Toby Beauchamp called Going Stealth, which is specifically about the interface of surveillance practices and the technologies involved in surveillance practices and trans lives, trans experiences. Um, that's brilliant that you should read if you're interested in this nexus of thought. Um, and then there's also a book by a political scientist named Heath Fogg Davis called Beyond Trans, Does Gender Matter? Where he basically argues that it makes no sense given 
the biometric technologies that currently exist to use gender as an identifier really ever, right? And he's not necessarily saying, I'm a huge fan of biometric identification technology, but he's saying we have it. So why are we still using gender markers, right? Um, and I have a lot of sympathy with that position. Hmm. So I, and I also think about people who have been writing specifically on intersex and in relationship to sports um, and also trans participation in sports because the argument articulated by people who work in that area is basically, you know, there's way more differentiation within sex categories than there is between sex categories. Mm. So why is this the sort of prevailing schematic that we're using to identify who can or who can't participate? Um, so yeah, I think I would like to see an end to it. And I think there are other identifiers that we could use, right? That are much more sort of individuated mm. than, than a gender marker. Yeah. And then just anecdotally, right? I mean, one of the most sort of infuriating technologies for trans and intersex folk is the ProVision L3 in the airport, right? Mm -hmm. So the scanner that you walk through. And I think they might be on a different version of that now. But for me in my head, because of that one against me song about it, there's, you know, it's always the ProVision L3, but the scanner that you go through. So I have, I live in this small college town. I go through this, I fly a lot. I go through the scanner all the time. The security folks kind of know me right at this point. And every time I go through the scanner, I get like a groin anomaly, regardless of whether they press the male button or the female button when I go through. And I don't know what's going on on the technological end that produces this, but I just know I always get pat down. And then it's like, do you want, they, they ask me often, do you want a female subject to pat you down or a male subject to pat you down? And then they're trying to get me to say like, this is how I identify. But I just start I just go, I'm non-binary, assigned female at birth and intersex, and I don't give a fuck who pats me down. I just want it to be done soon so I can get on this flight, right? Um, do, but, they, do they usually have someone with that? So. <laughs> <laughs> with what? With, who, with, with your same characteristics. Oh, they want to match yeah, you up Yeah, they want to match someone. you up. Yeah, right. no, they just have the, yeah, they, there's a really well-paid position, right? <laughs> or non-binary, intersex, trans, one non-binary, inter-trans person, right? That just comes out from like <laughs> behind the scenes and then pats me down and then goes back. And that's really the only work they do. Yeah. It's like five <laughs> minutes every three weeks, but it's paid really well and they have good benefits. Yeah, exactly. It's a union yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question fully, but I mean, I think that it's probably behooves folks who work in this industry, right? To think about how you can, if you are using these, developing these recognition technologies, how to do so without reifying binary sex and gender schematics. Because it ruins our days, right? If you're intersex and trans. Thank you, that, that, I think that clearly answers <laughs> at least part of that question. Uh, so now the social question. Um, many of us in this room um, and certainly I, as your friend, um, would like to help work on the social justice for intersex folks. Um, and you know, short of ending binary sex and gender myself, which I don't, I don't know if there's, there's like a pitchfork a or a torch challenge. that I can wield that will do that by myself, how can us as, um, you know, as purported allies help work in that direction? Like how, how can we be there for you? Like what, what can we do? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things is to really begin to do the hard work and it is hard work because it's a total epistemological reorientation of de-linking assumptions about embodiment from the gendered pronouns one uses, right? And this happens, I mean, we were talking yesterday and you said something, it was really charming. You said something like, I don't care what kind of gonads you have, it grabs you by them. And I was like, oh, that's really cute. It was like, I mean, it was great because it was obviously like Matt grappling with how to, how to say something like grabbing somebody by the balls without actually saying it and making it like intersex inclusive. Whatever, it's, maybe it seems crude. I thought it was really lovely. And I thought like if that happened, that kind of like attention to detail, right? If that happened just casually in the way that people interfaced with each other and spoke about embodiment and also spoke about desire and right gender, mm -hmm. um, that would be really lovely. It would make sort of day-to-day -day life that much easier. And then if you get used to doing that, then you get used to identifying how these continuities become enshrined and sort of sedimented institutionally. And that's the first step to working to undo them, right? When you're in a sort of decisional position where you can 
uh, sort of leverage power in ways that might help undo these sedimented sort of binary schematics. Yeah, but I think it starts just in the way that you think and the way that you talk about embodiment and everything that sort of stems from that. So the way you talk about reproduction, the way you talk about what kind of bodies you desire, et cetera. So it's a, it's a chest feeding room instead of a mother's room. Exactly. And, yeah. I, and I mean that like not a joke. Like, yeah. Um, that's helpful. Um, uh, there aren't people yet standing in front of these microphones, but I, I, want, I want you folks to start lining up. But I, I have one, I, I guess one other question. Um, other than this example of, 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 of mine that you used yesterday, haha, ha, thanks. Um, <laughs> it was really sweet. <laughs> oh, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> I try to be funny. Um, but what are examples that you've seen maybe institutionally or systemically that you feel are affirming? Uh, like, do you see many of them? Have you seen many of them? Yeah, I mean, I feel like one of, I feel like all of the innovations that we've seen institutionally around trans inclusion have the added benefit of fostering intersex inclusion. So I'm not gonna list all of those, but really like every time you see forms rework so that there's not this sort of coercive binary gender assignation that you mm. have to choose, right? That helps. Every time there are spaces that are gender inclusive and accessible and inclusive of all bodies, mm -hmm. right? That, that makes space for intersex people to feel more comfortable. Um, which is not to say that all intersex people are sort of visibly gender non-conforming. They're definitely not, right? Um, but it's a way that institutions signal a certain degree of awareness that then means your perambulations throughout the everyday become uh, sort of a less constantly triggering. And all of that really is um, you know, indebted to trans activism over the last very long time, many decades, right? Um, yeah, that's my short answer to that. Great, thank you. Um, I think you were the one that stirred first, so we'll start with you. Um, thank you for coming and, and thank you for your talk. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about as uh, intersex um, activism and awareness increases over time, how you currently think about the medical profession as a whole and a, a doctors individually. And specifically, do you see the medical profession as a potential ally or do you think that because of, or, or does the, the entire kind of institution think about intersex as a condition to be, uh, to be corrected and that is something that, that cannot be changed? Yeah, so I think it's definitely important. That's a great question. Um, I think it's important not to think about the medical industry or the medical industrial complex as a monolith. It's indeed not. Um, and most of the reforms that have happened in terms of this problematic intersex treatment protocol that I outlined really briefly earlier in the talk um, have happened because of consortiums of intersex people, parents of intersex children, and physicians working together to shift the paradigm medically. That said, there it's discontinuous, right, in the United States and also transnationally because John Money's protocol became sort of exported un unevenly, right, to different nation states. Um, so this problematic medical protocol persists while at the same time there is consistent resistance to it. And it really depends on the medical institution that you end up in, right, who's working there and who's been exposed to, whether people have been exposed to the critique of intersex pathologization or not, who did they train under, et cetera. So I think some of the most promising intersex activism has to do, and I do a little bit of this work, with talking with pre-med and medical students, right? And just sharing stories with them and getting them to sort of rethink this, this compulsion to shoehorn people into a binary sex schematic, right? Because their bodies are sort of actively resisting it. So. So yeah, I think that that's one of the promising frontiers of activism, but it still is really discontinuous. Cause there's no, I mean, there's also been no state or federal level regulation put in place around this. There's activism around getting that to happen in California in particular right now. Um, but in the absence of that, medical institutions are sort of left to their own devices to decide. And, and, and do you feel like there's space for that? And there's, there's um, or, or is it just about activism and awareness um, within the medical community, or is there active pushback, or do you feel like there's kind of inherent conflict as well? I feel like there doesn't have to be conflict, that the conflict is not necessarily inherent, but I feel like there are certain medical professionals that are entrenched in a particular way of doing things, and when that entrenchment sort of becomes obvious, then 
public activist pushback becomes necessary. So there are recently protests at the Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, um, which is one of the sort of main centers where this problematic medical protocol persists. Um, and it's also, interestingly, one of the sort of innovative centers of care for trans youth, too. So again, you see this entwinement of intersex and, and trans uh, medical protocol in ways that are complicated. Right, so they're doing really affirmative work, I think, with trans youth, um, but then also sort of insisting on this problematic medical protocol for intersex youth. But thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, um, yeah. Thank you for a well-informed session. I truly appreciate it. I got a question about the informed consent. Um, you mentioned at age 16 you had trouble you know, uh, understanding how to respond and so forth. And you also mentioned about some sort of treatment being happening from the uh, extremely early childhood mm -hmm. and infant session. How do you think that parents and guardians should um, play an active role in that informed consent when the if it's a baby level, right? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So, so right. If a, that's another great question. Um, so, if a child is born visibly intersex, then the consent obviously advocate or abdicates to the parents, right? Right. But what tends to happen in those instances is parents are often not aware of intersex conditions generally, right? Um, or if they are aware of them, they're aware of them, they tend to be aware of them in this way that's sort of othering and aberrant and pathologized, right? So the framework that they're relating to the condition within ha hinges on understanding their child is disordered, right, or deformed in some way. So you can see if that's how parents are exposed to knowledge about intersex conditions, then even though they're consenting on behalf of that child, they're consenting under conditions, again, of extreme coercion, right? Because they don't have access to, like, or awareness of, like, healthy intersex people, intersex activists, right? Parents of intersex children who are like, no, you can delay surgery, actually never have surgery, and they're still going to be healthy and all right. So that's, this is another sort of really important uh, front line of intersex advocacy and activism is making sure that physicians, when parents are confronted with an intersex child or have the child that they weren't expecting, um, right, because very few parents expect to have an intersex child, that they're then put in contact with intersex advocacy groups and parents of intersex children who have already sort of thought about all of these thorny dilemmas um, and also who recommend basically across the board a delay of any surgical treatment mm -hmm. until the child is old enough to consent to it. Right, that right. education is really key. Right, but that has to be coupled with an awareness, a, a destigmatizing awareness of intersex embodiment as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we actually have a question from the Dory. Um, in what ways do you think the trans community should or shouldn't be including intersex folks. As a trans person, I, want, I worry about perpetuating the assumption that all intersex people are trans. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, no, that is a good question, especially because, so I wanna give a little bit of context to this question too that I think is really important. For many, many years, for many years, the very same treatments that trans people were actively seeking out, right, the gender affirming procedures that trans people are actively seeking out, were rigorously gatekept from them. But the door was wide open, right, for intersex people to access those same procedures because it was seen as correcting a natural error. So what this meant, sort of pragmatically and operationally, was that when I was a teenager in the 90s, I could go, I could access vaginoplasty. I could access hormonal treatment. It was all covered by insurance because it was addressing this disorder, right? It could be billed as such. There wasn't a caveat on my insurance policy that said, no, 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 you can't access these procedures. At the same time, many, I mean, all of my trans friends in the 90s and early 2000s could not access the procedures that I was actively trying to like not access, but I was being pushed towards. Um, so there's, <laughs> that's crazy. It's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, that's the history. So, so given that there were some trans people that were like, well, if I could only prove that I have an intersex condition, then I could have access to medical treatment. So this produced, and it's totally understandable when you think about the gatekeeping, right? It produced this phenomenon of some trans people going to be tested, sometimes repeatedly, to find out whether they might have some sort of intersex condition just so they could get insurance coverage. Um, and this led to a conflation of intersex and trans identity in a way where Right, a lot of people even now, like I consider myself 
well, I am intersex and trans, right? I was assigned female at birth. I do not identify as female any longer. But there are many intersex people who do identify rather unproblematically as the gender they were assigned at birth, et cetera, et cetera. Not the same category, but there is this categorical confusion and it relates to this history of gatekeeping. Um, so I think one thing to do is just to insist, right, over and over again that trans and intersex, to clarify for people that they are not the same thing, although there are some intersex people who are trans and some trans people who are intersex, right, that it's like overlapping Venn diagram situation. Um, and that would be step one. And yeah, and then just resisting the assumption that everybody who's intersex is going to be somehow visibly non-conforming, right? I am, but actually most of the intersex people that I know that I know and know of are not, right? So you never really know when you're interfacing with somebody whether or not they have an intersex condition. Right. And that's just really important. So I kind of presume, and maybe this is not the best strategy, but I'm just gonna be honest with it, with you all about it. I just work from the assumption that everybody I meet is some combination of trans, intersex, or queer, and then I pretend <laughs> like to be surprised when I find out that they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Literally same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. Thank you. Uh, great lead in. Uh, I just want, first of all, say that people are so excited for this book. And as I've been reading it the past few days in, in a variety of settings, it's come up. Um, scholar, like m more excitement for a scholarly book than I think I've ever seen. Scholars, uh, people who may be intersex, uh, but just really saying that they're so excited for this book. So I'm really excited to see what comes of its life in the coming uh, months and years. And what I wanted to ask you was um, how to think about, how to think about explaining uh, gender differences and sex differences uh, medically in a way that doesn't become more surveillance. And I find when I try to talk to people about gender, across a wide variety of different kinds of populations. The social construction argument is actually working when you walk people through it. They can, many different kinds of people can, can understand, okay, gender is created through these various ways they can see it. But then they'll often, many of them will often say, but at some level there's biology. Um, and so this uh, op-ed by Anne Fausto Sterling that was in the Times, I think about a year ago or so, about how sex itself, how biology itself isn't determined, that I found is a very useful way to bring them in, saying you can almost put social construction to the side and say, and even still, there's all these variations within biology that make it something that's not so settled. Um, but I worry about, and particularly after hearing your talk and starting your book, are there ways to, to walk people through that and think about that that doesn't then become reason to, to become surveying and perform surveillance on all these different characteristics, particularly around athletics? And yeah. I, I think there is some consciousness around the stupidity of gender reveal parties as they are literally killing people now. And, and, and people starting to say we should call them genital reveal parties or chromosome reveal parties. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do, have you, do you have any thoughts about how to talk about that in a way that doesn't become, yeah, okay, now the athlete has to prove these 30 different categories to fall into one or the other, or, we, or that people have to explain it to get justification? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think about this a lot, right? Because we're taught that biology is in some ways ontological granite, right? Um, that when all is said and done, the biological is somehow coterminous with like the real. Um, and that's a, a maybe f unnecessarily fancy way of saying, if we admit that biological sex differentiation is much more complicated than a binary schematic allows us to, to think, does that then like entrench this turn to biology to justify, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that's happening with like pre-implantation diagnosis right now is that we're finding out that many more people are intersex than we probably would have otherwise thought, right? Um, statistically, and it's raising a lot of complicated questions because it's like, well then, you know, with pre-implantation genetic testing that can identify intersex conditions, does that encourage parents to then eliminate those, those children or those possible births? Um, but let me not stray too far from the point. I think that we do, if we keep treating biology as really fundamental, right? And the social is sort of like, and that includes gender, right? Gender is a social construct, is like scaffolding built on the biological. Um, then we run the risk of heightening surveillance technologies and then utilizing more and more testing to prove sex status. And I think what we instead should do is like just refuse all of that, 
right? And in the context of sports, this would mean right, if you if you identify as a woman, you can participate in women's sports, period, without any kind of sex testing. Um, the other, well, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm being necessarily clear in response to your question. Are you, so can I ask you a follow-up question just to get some clarity? What are the forms of surveillance that you worry about in relationship to? Potentially that somebody would have, so in a sports thing, that someone would have to prove categories or that to justify, um, to justify being considered intersex or trans or non-binary or gender non-conforming that somebody would then have to present present a reason to have that justification. Yeah, so like a proliferation of ever more finely grained sort of taxonomies yeah. of identity that require proof. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, this is where the gender abolitionist, you know, sort of framework comes into play, right? I think that's, I think we should not move in that direction, culturally, politically, and institutionally. I also see us increasingly moving in that direction, which is why I mentioned pre-implantation testing, right? Because that's one of the ways I see us moving culturally in this really troubling um, direction of intense surveillance and and then authenticity debates about who gets to identify as what based on what sort of evidence or proof. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of it. I guess that's the that's the answer, but it is a risk, right? And the more finely, the more refined technologies we have for sort of parsing <coughs> biological sex differentiation, the more we have to worry about those becoming operationalized in really sort of non-liberatory ways. All right, thank you. I think we have one more question. Yeah. Okay, is there time? I think there's time for one more, right? Really yep. fast. Time, time for one more question. Okay, sure. Um, so this is a purely selfish question, just preface. Um, as someone in the non-binary community who tends to date in the non-binary community, I have dated several people who have identified themselves to me as intersex. Do you have any advice for being a supportive partner to an intersex person? Yes, I do. I should put you in touch with my spouse, actually, who's a very supportive partner to intersex people. Um, but no, I mean, for real, like, I think that one of the most important things that you can do is understand that they're, if somebody is intersex, they, they don't necessarily, but they probably have a, a history of trauma in relationship to that kind of embodiment, especially depending on what their medical interface has been and how they feel about that. Um, so I think being aware of that is really fundamental. And also understanding that in your like, in your day-to-day -day dealings with them, in your intimate dealings with them, things might be triggering that you would never actually anticipate, right? Or it would be hard to anticipate. I also think that within, I'm very invested in like T for T, right? Modes of desire, eroticism, et cetera. Meaning like I'm a trans person who tends to really only date trans people. And I think that that's because um, there's just a very, very, a much more heightened sensitivity to these kinds of issues. Um, so I think the fact that you're, you are non-binary, right? And that you, you're already like a large part of the way there probably in terms of your awareness around the complexities of how sort of troubling bodies can be and how sensitive you have to be to dignify and respect bodies with histories of trauma. And that's, I mean, I, I, I'm saying this in intersex and trans context, but it's also true for cis people, right? I feel like all of the advice we give about how to be a good partner to intersex people and trans people should just be advice for how to be a good partner to anybody. What are you talking about? People, cis people are just so good at it. They're just <laughs> yeah, yeah. naturally, because they don't have relationship problems. Ever. Yeah, none, none. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone, for the great questions. And thank you, Hill. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.